thank you all for having me here. Uh, I'm always excited to come to OWASP chapter meetings. Uh, I got involved in OWASP in about 2002. And at that point, it was really just a mailing list. And I had this tool called, uh, well, it was really, it was actually called um, uh, Attacklet. And it was a tool that I'd written for teaching some classes that I've been doing in AppSec. And the OWASP list was talking about making a, a training program. They were going to call it Web Maven or something. And I was like, I've already got this one. I'll just give it to OWASP and release it. And that's what is WebGoat now. And I'm thrilled to hear that you guys are still ever. Who all here has used WebGoat? See, that's crazy. That's very cool to me that, uh, that that's still a thing. Um, and that's really, I think, OWASP has a lot of power that way. Like, you can create something that's cool and release it and affect millions of people. Uh, I don't know how many people have read the OWASP top 10, but it's a lot. And uh, that was just an idea I had in the shower after getting shot down at a bunch of clients who I was trying to sell AppSec to. I was like, we need a top 10. Okay. So I, I really encourage you to participate in the community. There's nothing been better for my career, nothing better than contributing to OWASP. Coming to meetings is great, but don't let it stop there. Go home, update the wiki, do something to make the world a better place. It's, it'll be great for you and great for the world. So um, today I'm going to talk about what I'm, what I'm calling unifying AppSec automation across dev and ops with something I'll call deep security instrumentation. So there's a lot there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start very high level, drill way down to the lowest weeds possible, and then I'm going to try and zoom back out to give you guys a little perspective on you know, sort of how I see the world. So a uh, quick question here before we start into this. Um, who, who thinks the perimeter is dead? Anybody heard that? Not everybody? Some people. <laughs> so I hear, that, I hear this all over the place. And uh, so you know, if you go to Gartner, they'll tell you the perimeter's dead. Second question is a uh, little different. So who thinks they have more internal applications than they do external apps? More internal? A few more external? So that was a trick question. If there's no perimeter, and I saw you raise your hand for the first question, if there's no perimeter, there's no internal and no external anymore. <laughs> right? We still think in those terms, though. It's a mindset thing. And I, I think I want everybody to, to understand the world's changing. And the idea of having an internal app inside your perimeter is really kind of dead. All right, so I want to ask you, I want to try to put it to you, you know, are you secure? If somebody asks that question, how do you answer that? <laughs> no, that's right. Uh, <laughs> okay, let's say you wanted to go to like the next level of detail, right? Like, how would how would you you know argue that you were secure or weren't secure? What kind of of arguments would you make? Well, what are you saying? What is secure? Your network or your data? Well, really, we're talking. This is OWASP, so let's talk about applications, right? Well, I, we can talk about you know some of the other layers another time, but you know, sort of philosophically, I'm just focused on applications. But I want to I want to try to get under that question because I think it's actually, you know, for all the experts in the in the room, I bet you'd get 200 different answers if you went and asked that. So I'm I'm trying to dig under that. So uh, you know what kind of arguments would you make if you were trying to argue that you were secure or your web app was secure? If you said that, then I know you're lying. <laughs> See, I'm not buying that line of thinking, OK? I, I hear that a lot. And a lot of security people are naysayers. They're always doom and gloom about security. But oh, it's, hey, yeah. I talk about the maturity of myself for security. You could. That's, a, that's some evidence, right? That's, that's a good piece of evidence that says it's not a direct piece of evidence, right? That's indirect evidence that your software is coming out good. It's like saying, oh, well, my car was made by you know, this really good car making team, so therefore you know, it doesn't have any flaws in it, which is you know, it's a good piece of evidence, but it's not the whole thing. What I want to get to is the, the question demands that you define what security means, right? You have to say, what are your expected security defenses in order for you to say whether you've got them and whether they're any good or not? So I, I really encourage you to figure out you know, what you actually care about and specify it. Now, in most organizations, you've got policies, you've got security requirements, you've got some pen test 
tools that you use that have a certain rule set associated with them. You got all these different sources. You got threat models, maybe. You might have some architectures. All these things really boil down to what I'm going to call an expected security model. And I don't care what your expected security model is. All I know is if you want to ever say that you're secure, you got to have one because you're secure relative to some kind of model of what you mean by security. And most organizations don't, this isn't clear. They haven't thought this through. Now your whole security model might be, I use X-Frame options to defend against clickjacking on all my apps. If that's the only threat you care about, because your only attacker out here is focused on uh, clickjacking as an attack vector, then maybe that's what your model is. You're like, okay, and as long as you make sure that you've got X-Frame Options header on every single web page that you generate, then you're secure. And uh, the reason I'm harping on this is because I see so many particularly young pen testers going out, and I spent you know, 15 years of my life doing pen tests and code reviews, so I've got a lot of experience here. But going out without a plan, right? You just, you go to OWASP talk and you hear about XML external entities. And you're like, yeah, man, I'm going to test that. And that's what you test the next day for your job. That's OK, but you need to figure out how it fits into the expected security model. Maybe you care about XXE, maybe you don't. It's really important that you have that plan. So ultimately, I believe that security is something that you can generate. It is a thing that you can produce. And the, the way it manifests itself is in the form of evidence. So when you get done with a pen test, you typically generate a pile of vulnerabilities, right? That's sort of negative evidence. It would be much better if your test produced evidence of all the security controls that were in place and correct and working. And you had a few that were missing. Those are the gaps, right? But then you take that to the CISO or the CIO or AppSec team manager or whoever, you're presenting them assurance that what you built is all correct because you showed every place that you checked. So SQL injection is a good example. We had a talk on that earlier. If I wanted to prove to you that the app an application didn't have SQL injection in it, what kinds of evidence could I give you? I might run static analysis, but they would have to do you know, sort of full data flow analysis to really figure it out, right, in order to, to really prove it. And static analysis tools, data flow analysis, a little sketchy, right? You end up with a lot of false alarms and, and so on. But it's not a bad approach. What if I could easily show you that, well, okay, so usually I get the answer, well, you could test it, right? Well, let's just go with burp suite and bang on it for a little while, or I'll run some dynamic scanner. Th those aren't really very strong pieces of evidence, right? So I'm encouraging as a pen tester, oh, oh so the right answer, by the way, is to make sure that the application is using prepared statements everywhere without using any untrusted data in them, OK? You know, you have to use the, the parameterization feature of it. If you do that, and that could be a grep, and you could prove it pretty damn convincingly to me that there's no SQL injection in an application very fast, very fast. So I want you to get mercenary. Yeah? Uh, unless your guys run one of those databases that the first right. speaker was showing already has the stuff in it, so you're relying on That's them. true. Um, Absolutely true. Just as an alternative, um, not to say that it is sufficient or better or anything, but just sort of as a first principle, usually the guy who asks you if you are secure wouldn't understand your answer if you had it in that sense. Yeah. So sometimes you find when someone says, are you secure, you may, in your threat model, have some very simple um, asset-based claims. Like, this cannot happen to this trade, I mean, using a business term so that yeah. the managing director actually knows what you're talking about. Yeah. This cannot happen to this trade without collusion. Or, and again, then yeah. the risk manager understands that. And it's the, a very short list. The and things that matter are actually pretty minimal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, 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 you know, like, we're not going to have this happen to us without... So there's a much longer version of this talk where we, this is actually a, a hierarchical security story where, you know, at the top level, there's three or four things you care about. And then to, to really prove them, you've got to break those down. And at some level, you get to things that look like the ASVS, 
yeah. you know, individual things that you have to prove about your application. And if you want to be a great pen tester, what you're going to get is absolutely stupid mercenary fast about proving these things one way or another, yeah. right? You're going to use the absolute fastest technique available in your toolbox. So, you know, read the OWASP testing guide, a lot of great recipes in there. Learn how code works so that you can quickly search for these things in the code and prove them. But every application is different, so you need to have a very well-developed toolbox so that you can do this crazy fast. Because the, the pressure on pen testers is increasing dramatically. Applications are getting more complex, organizations have more apps, and the set of security requirements is getting bigger. So the pressure on pen testers to do, and the teams aren't getting bigger. It's, it's going to be more apps per year per pen tester. So if you want to really do this, you got to get super fast about it. All right, well, that was a long way around to get into this talk. But I think that's really important. And you'll see things online like this. Like this is Apple Pay's security page. And it's pretty cool. You read through this, and I read it the first time, and I was like, Wow, that's pretty cool. They're doing tokenization. They're using this new form of, uh, you know, near field communication to you know, that all these security features sound great. And then I, I was in, I realized I was in that uh, Steve Jobs uh, uh, reality distortion field, and I went whoa, and I thought, this is all just bullshit. Like I don't, I mean, this is all claims. Right? So from now on, whenever you read a security architecture document or a security description about anything, that's a set of claims that without any evidence. Now, I think this is really cool that Apple put this out there and they're describing how they work, but you, we're going to need people to go verify this stuff. Like Charlie Miller will probably do half of it and the rest of us can work on the other stuff. But that's the job is verifying security claims, how you believe the security model should be. And they may not have gotten this right. The really, you know, the tricky stuff is what I call the dogs that didn't bark after the Sherlock Holmes novel. There are claims that should be here that aren't. That that's where you need to see what's not on the page if you want to be a great pen tester. Okay? All right, so let's drill forward. So uh, frankly, we suck at Testing, security testing is, we're not great at it. Um, we are not generating assurance. So, you know, on average, uh, we find 22.4 vulnerabilities per application. It's a ton, right? So something's going haywire. We're not really getting very good coverage. When I go to organizations, I see coverage over their application portfolio is frequently like 10% of them are getting security tested. Well, the other 90%, what is going on with them? Well, they didn't make the cut because they're not critical enough. But that's a serious problem. All those apps are, you know, they're one click away from the Wall Street Journal. And vulnerability coverage is also pretty terrible here. If you're running a tool, like, you know, I saw Tom Ryan's program was built around running SAST and DAST. If that's all you're doing, then you're criminally negligent because most of the, the critical vulnerabilities are in authentication, access control, and encryption. The other one I'd put in the top list there is injection, and tools are okay at injection, but those other three, you'll never find those flaws with tools, okay? So we got, you've got to do more than, than just the tools, so our coverage is pretty terrible. And in terms of process fit, and this is really important, is the way that we practice AppSec, it's pissing everybody off. I go into so many companies and I say, you know, hey, how are the developers and the security people, you know, are they, are they happy with each other? And developers are, are not, in general, happy with security, right? We're perceived as interfering, slowing down, blocking, creating trouble, maybe not, you know, reporting stuff and overhyping it. And to be fair, some of those critiques are real, right? So in the end of the day, I think this is, you know, this is an indictment on how we're doing AppSec, and I think we need to think about how to change this, particularly as software development gets faster and faster, and somebody raised that point earlier. So just I thought this would be a useful slide to talk about the difficulty of this job. Uh, when you look at complexity levels, this is sort of in lines of code, and you've got the space shuttle here is you know, 400,000 lines of code. You go up, Spring Framework is 1.1 million. US tax code is 4.4 million lines of code. You know, a typical application, 
that you know an enterprise application that we see today could easily have 10 million lines of code if you include the libraries. Most of them are you know a few hundred thousand lines of custom code and then several million lines of libraries. So it's very easy to get up to big numbers here. And you go on up here, you got uh, your typical car has 100 million lines of code in it, mouse DNA, 120 million lines of code. And then if you look at a financial organization, mid-sized financial with a thousand applications, each one has you know a couple hundred thousand lines of custom code and maybe another you know 900,000 lines of, of libraries. Each one's a million, that's a thousand times a million. So your typical financial organization has got a billion lines of code that they're managing and that you have to secure. That's a lot. Now, how long would it take you to go through the US tax code and find all the loopholes? Yeah, but we're being asked to do that in the course of a week or two weeks pen test code review effort. It's a staggering job to do right. So I, I think you know this is important for people to understand it's just how hard this job is um, at scale. So when I look at the way AppSec programs are set up, this is sort of your traditional AppSec program. You got bunches of application projects all executing concurrently. By the way, if you ever see those SDL pictures where they show you one project at a time, they look so pretty, don't they? They're like, oh yeah, look, we'll do, we'll do uh, you know, inception here and then we'll do a ar security architecture. That'll be a gate and then we'll go on down and we'll do security requirements and then we'll go a little farther. We'll do you know, testing or maybe we'll do code review or like pen, uh, sorry, static analysis. Then a little later we'll do a full pen test and then so on. That's great in theory. But when you try to scale it, what you realize is that there's this huge bottleneck. All of our processes are built around experts running expert tools. Like, I, I, I compare them to, you know, uh, uh, tunneling electron microscopes and mass spectrometers, right? You need an expert to run the tool, and there's a small number of experts. You know, this in a, in a large organization, this could be a team of 20 people, right? So you, you can't run all these through all at the same time particularly if you're an agile shop and this is you're getting a new release every two weeks right you just can't it doesn't scale at all so I looked I realized this a couple of years ago and I spent my career being an AppSec expert right like I was I was in this box and I was like holy crap I'm the problem like I'm preventing AppSec from actually working because I can't scale to do this work so you know this is really to say that automation is critically important and that if you're really doing application security, you will focus on automating AppSec instead of trying to do it by hand over and over again. So I want you to think about every time you do a pen test, instead of delivering a finding or a vulnerability, I want you to deliver a script or a tool or a procedure that will repeatedly find that forever so that you never have to do it again. There are, don't worry about putting yourself out of a job because there are actually a lot of really hard problems, really useful problems that need your skills. We don't need you to find yet another XSS. Can I add something to that? Yeah. Um, Azure shops especially, they're putting out code constantly. Yeah. You do a pen test today and you don't get the many tools to check. A week later, they open up 100 vulnerabilities and get hacked and then they come after you. So actually giving them tools to be able to check again after you're gone, every time they release, absolves you of all these, of being sued, because a week, <laughs> a week, a week later, they get hacked. You actually sue people in your own company? <laughs> I'm talking, I'm That's good culture, I'm and security that. culture is really important. So actually, I want, to, I want you to think about, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so you're giving, the code, you're giving them code, okay, from a legal standpoint, doesn't that make you liable, especially if the code doesn't change? This is all, I mean, I'm, this is really all internal. It's, it's, it, you know, you have to think, I mean, if you're thinking about it from a consulting point of view. Yeah, that's what I have right. yeah. So I'm thinking it from a consulting point of view. Yeah. You, you, well, we can talk after, but there's a difference between, you know, like criminal liability and contractual liability, and your contract should cover it. If you're delivering code to verify something, well, we'll talk about it later. That's kind of... I, what, what, I, what has to happen in companies, though, is you have to switch over from having this huge stack of things to verify manually every single time you release code. You have to switch those over and start automating them. So you, slowly, over time, you're left with a couple things that you have to validate manually because they're really hard. 
and a whole bunch of stuff that happens automatically. This is the genius of DevOps, is DevOps is doing this for software development. They're turning quality assurance into tools and automating everything so that when they hit, you know, a, submit a code change, it can go through a pipeline that runs all the, the tools, the CI server runs, runs all the tests, runs all the QA, runs whatever, performance test, and pushes it into production with quality, right? That's what we need to do for security. And the cool thing is that the DevOps guys are paving the way for us. They are building the infrastructure for us to do this already. And you're starting to see people run static analysis in their CI server, which is fine. Uh, it's a better place to run it. But we can do even better than that. So let me keep going. So the, in order to automate, we need better accuracy. Who's, who's wrestled with false alarms in their tools? Yeah, it takes forever, right? Your tools generate tons of false alarms. It's a pain. The key to getting accurate findings is context. And by context, I mean really what's going on inside the code. And so when I did pen tests and code reviews, we always did them together. So I, you know, we'd look at the code a little bit, figure out how it works, and say, oh, I bet if we test it this way, it'll work. And we'd test it, and it wouldn't work. And we'd look at the code again and we get a little more context, and we figure out how to test it, and we go back and forth. This is the way that you get accurate security findings fast, is by using all the information that's available. And so that, to me, that, that was a, a wake up moment when I started thinking about how to do this better. So when you see a vulnerability, it's really not at one particular line of code. I just, I'm, a lot of you probably know this, but a vulnerability is not like there. It's you have a vulnerable path through the application, right? So this HTTP request comes in, and the controller pulls out some HTTP parameter, a header, a cookie, or something. Maybe it sticks it in a bean and passes it off to a business function that takes that data out and does some transaction. Maybe it calls a data layer to, you know, and eventually it gets into a SQL query that goes to the database, right? That path. If nowhere along that path is there you know, sort of validation or encoding or parameterization or something, then you've got a SQL injection vulnerability, right? But it's the whole path that's vulnerable. It's not one particular spot. And it's the same thing on the way out. The data could flow you know, into libraries and back out and back and forth and, and so on. And maybe you've got an XSS on the way back out. But in order to identify that vulnerability accurately, you've got to have the context of how all this is working inside. So, uh, in 2009, I did a talk at Black Hat. I called it Enterprise Java Rootkits. And I was studying the problem of what would a malicious Java developer do inside a major financial organization. And I thought, you know, this could really happen. I had some clients that were wrestling with similar problems. And I was like, well, let's, let's examine it. Let's see how bad it could be and, you know, what could they really do. And maybe we can learn from those techniques. Uh, well, long story short, it turns out that it's really dangerous, right? Like in a couple lines of code, you can do some terrible, terrible things and make it look almost invisible. So, you know, if you're interested in that problem, go check out the paper because I list about, I don't know, 50 different ways of, of really subverting an enterprise. But along the way, I discovered this thing called the Java Instrumentation API. Anybody played around with it? A couple people. Oh, yeah. And... Uh, so this is super powerful. It allows you to modify running applications, right? change the code. You can actually take a class out, change the bytes, and stick it back into the running JVM you know, while it's going. And I was like, that is the mother load of backdoors. Uh, because you could totally make your, you, you put your attack in, take it out uh, when you're done, and nobody could ever figure it out. But I, I thought, hey, you know what? Maybe there's a way to use this for good. And uh, I spent the next five years, you know, trying to figure it out. The way this works is, uh, you know, this is a sort of picture of instrumentation API and how it works. Essentially, you can hook the class loader so that as the original bytecode loads off disks from jar files or class files or whatever, you can hook them, change them how you want, and replace them into the running application. So I was like, wait a minute, maybe I could use that as a way to gather the context that I need in order to identify vulnerabilities, right? If I could just see all the security critical transactions along this path, I could actually see SQL injection as it happens in a running application. And so that took a little while to get working, but I, 
I got it along with Arshan uh, Debirziaghi at at, at uh, contrast. And and so there's a number of advantages to this approach. So if you're if you're using SAST, you've really got access to the source code. All your context has to come out of the source code, right? If you're using DAST, all your context has to come from HTTP requests and responses, right? Because that's all you can really see. But if you're, if you're inside the running application, you can see the code and you can see the HTTP, but you can also see all the libraries that are used. You can see all the live backend connections, like you know, actual queries going to the database. You can see the runtime data flow as it flows through the application. Really, anything you want to see going on inside the app, you could create a sensor for it and instrument it into the application. And, and for me, this was a, a revelation. I spent you know, the next few years figuring out how we could monitor all these different kinds of vulnerabilities from within the running application. And I'm excited to say we, we released a, a free tool that you can try out instrumentation for yourself. I'm going to demonstrate it. It's called <coughs> Contrast for Eclipse. And I've got uh, a uh, Eclipse running here. This is, uh, you can go to the Eclipse Marketplace, type in contrast, and add this to your Eclipse for Java EE very quickly. Um, and I've got a little sample application called TicketBook. It's a little bit WebGoat-like. It's just got a bunch of uh, you know, demonstrations in it. And I'll, I'll pull this down so you can see. So all you have to do is start this application. So I'll go to the, the Servers tab here. And normally, you would just hit Start. But now with, with contrast, you can just hit start with contrast. Okay, and what this does is all that does is add the, the contrast agent to the launch configuration when you launch this application, right? So now it's running with instrumentation enabled. And contrast basically does what I said. It, it just instruments the application as it loads and then monitors for uh, vulnerabilities and, and so on. So uh, let me show you how this works. So I've got, here's the little registration page. I'm just going to put in Jeff, Baltimore, put in a credit card. Notice I don't have to do any hacking or anything. I just fill out the, the form. And if you can see down here, that fast, we discovered SQL injection, cross-site scripting, three cross-site scriptings, actually, and an insecure encryption algorithm. So what we're doing is we're just observing the instrumented application as it runs and discovering vulnerabilities in real time. So if I wanted to go through and just you know, click on these pages and, and click on links and forms and stuff, you can discover vulnerabilities very quickly, uh, as fast as you can browse pages. OK? So let's dig into one of these here. You can double click on the vulnerability, and it'll take you right to the line of code. And it'll show you what we call sort of the evidence for this vulnerability. So if you browse through this, you can see here's the exact line of code where that parameter was read from the HTTP request. So this read the ticket parameter. And there's the actual value that was passed in. And you can see how the query was built. Uh, you, know, you can see that the full select and then the line where the, <coughs> the query was sent to the database. And you can see the actual SQL query that went to the database. So in some ways, the results look a little bit like uh, a, a weird merge of static results and dynamic results, right? You got all the stack kind of information, the lines of code and so on, but you also have the full HTTP request and all the details of the runtime data flow all in one place. So much richer kind of vulnerabilities. And if you're a pen tester, I want you to think about, you know, just from now on, why wouldn't you put an agent in the application that you're testing? so that you can get the telemetry from what's going on while you're actually testing it. Do you want to know, did you hit the database? Well, put a sensor on the database API so that you can see if you hit it. It's just so much faster to do things this way than to, you know, to test blind or rely on just static. Um, any questions about this? Did, yeah. Did you have to identify the methods beforehand or anything like that? Like, put the sensors on, I'm thinking of other like code injection type tools where you need yeah. to set sensors to... No, so uh, there, there's really, uh, everything happens dynamically. So it's all, all the, the rules and this, you know, where the sensors go is all packaged in the agent. So you know, it, it comes with a set of rules about how Java and Java EE applications work 
and it knows. It actually it's, it handles most of the major frameworks uh, automatically. So your struts and spring and JSF and all that, you know, we don't have a problem with that. And it, it actually an analyzes the entire application, you know, not just the custom code, but all the libraries and all the data flow through all the libraries. So, you know, if you've used static, you've seen those uh, lost sources and lost syncs which generate tons of false alarms. Well, Contrast doesn't have that at all because we're tracking the data wherever it goes in the whole application. So I think what you'll find is this much more accurate than uh, you know, traditional tools in that sense. Any other questions on this? Yeah. It doesn't need the source code. Uh, you know, when it runs in it, to do the analysis, it's actually monitoring the running binary. But uh, in order to display it, you need the project to, you know, the, the Eclipse project. So it just links into that from the stack information. Yeah. Does it check for library calls? It does actually tell you all the libraries that have known vulnerabilities in them. And it will also report if you've got a library that has a buried SQL call in it, for instance, and you pass untrusted data into that library, it'll tell you that's a SQL injection you know, that terminates in the library. It's not really a CVE. It's just a hazardous call. Uh, is it like similar to FlawFinder? Uh, so FlawFinder is static, right? Like purely static. This is nothing like that. And in fact, some people are trying to market what they call, uh, you know, um, what do they call it? Lightweight static analysis, which is nonsense as far as I'm concerned. You have to have heavyweight f data flow analysis to find vulnerabilities. If the tool only looks at one file at a time, you will never find a real vulnerability with it. Yeah? So a couple of years ago, I had a number of clients that were in new, new to DevOps and Agile. Yeah. You couldn't even finish it before so, they delivered another version. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so what I guess is, is the upshot here that because there's uh, automated testing in most DevOps environments for all quality assurance, that this is like just an extra freebie that comes with functional testing without any other additional testing or inputs. That's right. It's a, actually it's a way of repurposing the the existing infrastructure and effort that you put into QA testing now becomes security testing. OK, I, I'm going to stop. I'll take some more questions in a second, but I want to uh, push on because I got uh, another major point that I want to talk about. So here's what I see going on with, with tools. So historically, there have been tools to detect vulnerabilities that you use during development. And that's what probably most of you are familiar with using. And then there's tools that stop attacks, things like web application firewalls, IDS, IPS, those kinds of technologies are used in production. And anybody think it's weird? There's no, no connection between these tools at all. Every once in a while, someone will say, oh, well, we're going to take the output from our scanner, and we're going to feed it into the WAF and automatically block stuff. Anybody ever effectively deploy that? Yeah, it doesn't really work, right? You have, to have, you have to be much more accurate. You need more context to do that, actually. And so. I'm going to say yesterday, we had in development, we've got SAST and DAS tools. And then on the operations side, we've got web app firewalls and, and IDS, IPS. And uh, so that's, I think, yesterday's tools. I think today's tools are IAST and RASP. And if you listen to Gartner, this is the, their acronym. So you know, I'm, I apologize. I, I don't actually like these terms in particular. But basically, IAST is doing security testing with an agent. Now, some of the IaaS solutions out there, you know, Contrast for Eclipse is free. There are, there are a few others, but they involve an agent. Some of them involve the DAS scanner, you know, so a traditional kind of vulnerability scanner that hooks up with an agent. Some of them sort of involve SAST a little bit. But there's an agent that runs on the application server that gives that context. And so that, I mean, that's the critical distinguishing feature of IaaS for me. And then on the RASP side, interestingly, uh, people are selling runtime application self-protection technology, which is essentially you know, making the application protect itself. So uh, some of the implementations are, are agent 
Some of the implementations are platform based, some are sort of filter based, but the idea is just we're enhancing the application itself as opposed to trying to put a web app firewall in front of it or an IPS in front of it, right? So interesting, I think, uh, that these are kind of headed the same direction, right? Like this brings testing inside the app and this brings protection inside the app. And so I believe that the next generation of this is to try to put a development and operational technology in one agent that you can add to your application. And now when you start out in development, you'll get feedback instantly on vulnerabilities. And as it progresses, you'll, you'll have constant monitoring of, of vulnerabilities. But when you shift into production, that same agent will now detect attacks and block attacks if you enable it. And you can do that all from an agent using instrumentation. And the cool thing is it solves the context problem because the agent, by, being a, by virtue of being inside the running application, it can do the things that your developers should have done themselves, but didn't for whatever reason, right? So if you break this down, you know, I, essentially you take all those technologies and squinch them together into an agent that you can apply to an application using instrumentation. And if this happens, I think it'll be really powerful. This will mean that now your application is itself protected. So if you move it, you're not going to have to move all that web app firewall infrastructure and all the, you know, the load balancing and all that stuff. The protection is in the app. So you want to move your app to the cloud? Great. Protection goes with the app wherever it goes. So I think it solves a lot of the sort of logistical problems associated with uh, you know, AppSec technology over the years. So a couple of stories about this, like just to give you the flavor of it. So let's say your concern in your expected security model, let's say your concern is that you've got libraries out there with known security flaws. I was just talking to uh, a, a prospect for us that uh, they've got thousands of applications, and they, they said a ton of them are old versions of Struts and Spring. They estimated the amount of work that it would be to update all those. You know, the OS top 10 glibly says like, well, well, you just need to move to the latest version. Well, they estimated the amount of work, $10 million for them to move those applications to the latest version of the framework. Uh, Joy, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so it's, it's expensive. Um, so imagine if you deployed, you had this agent sort of everywhere across your application portfolio that could tell you where all your libraries are, what versions they are, which ones are vulnerable, and then potentially even protect against attacks on those libraries. Now, uh, you know, instead of, so it's kind of turning application security inside out, right? Instead of you guys, pen testers, having to reach out to an application and test it and, you know, get the data, now all the applications are reporting themselves back to you. It's a big data kind of approach here. So for uh, third-party libraries, you know, we can do a lot better than how we're currently doing. I don't know if any, any of you have been involved in a, a third-party library project. And you have to go around to all the different software projects and ask them what libraries are they using and what do they say? And no idea. <laughs> or they got to run some tool and they got to go check and they give you a printout and you got, I mean, it's, it's a ton of work per app. If you've got a thousand apps, it's, it's a career. <laughs> and that's, that's no fun for anybody, right? But we can solve this problem with big data by having all this reported back to us so that we can make smart decisions about you know, dealing with insecure libraries. Um, another story is sort of SQL injection oriented, right? So imagine now you've got the agent out there in your development environments, in your staging environments, in your QA environments. So now you're writing the code Developers typing along, ch -ch 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 -ch, test his code locally. Oh, bam, SQL injection. Crap, what do I do? It's got advice right there on how to fix it. They fix it, retest, and you can put a policy in place that says you can only check in code when it's clean. Think about how that changes application security. Right now, half of our work is just tracking the stupid vulnerabilities that we find in various databases and risk registers and you know risk rating them coordinating them with the development team making sure they got fixed retesting them all that work is gone if we can enable the developers to do this themselves we just don't have to do that 
and it saves a ton of money that way. So the you know, first thing is, let's get developers enabled right away to produce secure code. But then later, you can do the same, you can enable the agent in your QA environment or your staging environment or wherever and, and verify again that everyone in dev did the right thing. Right? So you got you don't have to, with, with a, this agent approach, it's passive. So there's very little cost to doing it multiple times. Bill. In the real world where, as you said earlier, there's a couple hundred thousand lines of code and millions of lines of libraries, yeah. you'd never get a clean compile or, or whatever you want to call it these days because if, if you put that control in there. Well, you can always make a rule that says, you know, no criticals or... Well, and, okay. So, okay. I mean, I, I, I'm actually sympathetic to that because, you know, if you're an organization with tons of code, yeah. tons of vulnerable, vulnerable code out there, you don't want to you know, just drop that on everyone all at once. Right. I mean, in some cultures that might work, but uh, there might even be liability associated with that. But I think you can raise the bar slowly if you have the information. You know, I would say, first thing, let's stamp out SQL injection, because that's, that's what people are exploiting. If you look at the Verizon DBIR, that's how people are getting in. So let's stamp that one out, and then deal with the next thing whatever it is for you. And again, I, I don't know what your expected security model is, but you should. And then you should enforce it automatically. And all I'm saying here is that this agent-based approach is a much better way to automatically enforce whatever you decide your ESM is. Just two other things, and I, I yeah. this is not things that you can answer now, but just things to think about. Yeah. One is, um, have you thought through the threat model of people attacking the sensors? You know, you have your normal situation yes. of, I got these things, and now I got these sensors, they attack the sensors, I shut down because I think I'm being attacked yeah. and I'm not, etc. Sure. Um, and the other situation is, as you talked about fusing those two things, have you thought through a threat model where you may have insufficient separation of duties? Uh, that is to say, I want to do these things in development, I want to do yeah. these things in production, it's the same thing, oops, there's a an attack on the development side that wasn't important that if the agents running in production could be important. And lastly, and I'm running into this all the time, because remember, I, I, I'm like a private bank. Yeah. So I get people at the big firm saying, well, can you give us the evidence of a particular yeah. thing, say a data governance, data quality issue? And yeah. the answer is no, that data can't cross that border. Sorry, Charlie. And you just talked about you know, I'll run it, and yeah. I'll tell you, no trouble found. But uh, in your big data scenario, it's also the flow of that information. If you yeah. say the application is now instrumented, is that a back channel? Is that a spy? Yeah, so... Uh, Just three uh, things to think. No, it's interesting, and I think the short answer to all of them is that it really is how you use it, yeah. because, you know, you can use instrumentation for a lot of different yeah. things, but... Uh, I'll, I'll follow up with you on that. Um, so, so then SQL injection, I think, uh, you know, imagining that you stamped out most of it in dev, you verify that none snuck through in QA, and then you go into production and you've got defenses so that you can detect people trying to attack you with SQL injection, you've got a real a package of of controls here that's that's effective. So um, I'll stop there, and if there's any questions or, or thoughts, I'd love to answer them. Well, yeah. What's the performance hit you get in in prod? Oh yeah. So the um, so detecting vulnerabilities is more of a performance hit than blocking attacks, and so uh, you know I think you'd run the full data flow engine in dev. And the, the performance hit there, there is one. It, you won't notice it in a test environment uh, or a QA environment. In prod, you want to be super efficient. So you know the, the, the prod agent, you, your use of a instrumentation in prod is much different than in dev. Yeah, good question. Thank you. Yeah. The security agent you demonstrated, is that just for Java-based Java, um, frameworks? Or can it be implemented in other stacks like Django or uh, Express.js? It, uh, the technique can be used in any environment. We've implemented it in, 
in .NET and Node.js, and we're going to do PHP uh, and on the commercial side. This is a free thing that we released because we think it's important and we want people to learn about instrumentation. But yeah, the technique is kind of general. It can be used in any environment. The, you know, the specifics of it are, are different in each language. Yeah. What, what solutions do you like there? Generically. Um, I mean, I like contrast for Eclipse. Like, well, <laughs> I'm not sure I understand right. the question. So, are you saying contrast for Eclipse gives them that real time solution? Yeah. It, so it finds the error real time. Yep. It doesn't give the recommendation. It, it does. And I'll give you a little story real quick. My son's 15 years old. He, uh, he wrote a web app for his school. His school has a writing center. And he wanted to build a web app for them that would allow students to upload papers, get emailed to advisors, get feedback, and send it back to the students. So you know, it's just a simple web app. And he came to me and said, uh, hey, I think you should look at this. And I'm like, uh, I want to see if you can do contrast. right? So I just pointed him at the thing. He went, and half an hour later, he came back. And he said, Dad, I had four cross-site scripting and two SQL injection. And I was like, well, you know, that's, that's going to happen. It's, uh, it's, and he's like, but I fixed them. And I was like, wow, that's really awesome that a novice programmer could use it to go actually fix vulnerabilities without any help in a web application that they wrote. Uh, you know, I think that's different. I, I can't imagine anyone doing that with static or dynamic. All right, thank you very much. Oh. Is this yeah. Have you found any class of those things with the recommendation you can automate the fix in? Sort of like in the old days of optimizing compilers. You said, well, I can do that. Sure. You have. Absolutely. Excellent. Yeah. What, what, any coverage percentage estimate? Um, well, there's different ways of dealing with problems. And, and I, there, there's a lot of theory here. But yeah. you know, it, it depends on how far away from the, the, the trigger you get with the fix. Like if it's a single line vulnerability, like you know, yeah. somebody's using the wrong random number generator or something, you can fix it in one place. That's easier. But as you get farther away, um, you, it gets a little trickier. And when you get to the front door, you know, where the, the attacks are coming in, you can block them there as well. And then you're, you're like more like a WAF that's been put inside the running application. Yeah. So there's, there's a, you know, I, I think there's a fix for almost every vulnerability. but they're all different, depending on the, the act, actual structure of their vulnerability. Okay. But, yeah. That, that's great. Our, our goal is to prove, we're, we're trying to create what we call do no harm patches for these vulnerabilities, because it's critical that we don't break any applications right. with this, right? So you got to make it harmless. Yeah. Thank Thanks, Bill.